Uh, great. Uh, I'll be uh, reasonably brief so we can get to the uh, Q&A session. I like, what I like to do is um, uh, say a few things about in a, in a reasonably quantitative way to make three points and then uh, try to pick up a uh, little bit that uh, I hadn't really prepared, but since Victor asked me to say something about running B, uh, and as you know, he, he was my boss, may become my boss, uh, so I have to say something. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to say something about the, another look of the China's five-year plan, and I'd like to also point to some features about trade that is going on in China, India, Japan, and since we are Hong Kong, we throw in Hong Kong as well. Uh, one of the things is, uh, since China's opening, we've seen real GDP growth rates growing on average at 10.8% over 30 years. I mean, this is uh, you know, unbelievable, but then it's already history. Um, but the other thing is, I'd like to emphasize is, during that period of 30 years of 10.8%, we have four big economic cycles in China, which means peak to peak in eight years. So uh, this is incredibly high amplitude and, uh, 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 and uh, frequency. Um, so what I'd like to show you is, this is China's GDP. This is the red line. Look how dramatic it fluctuates. It, it just moves up and down every... Uh, uh, eight years, it goes from peak to peak. This is, this is also unprecedented, uh, which means, you know, last thing I'll do is to make a point-to-point -point forecast about what's going to happen to China next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing is actually very significant is you notice that the, uh, the yellow part has been really declining rapidly as a share of GDP, and that's the primary sector. And the blue part is the tertiary sector, which is service sector that's growing modestly. And the green part is really the, grow, the one that's growing rapidly, as the manufacturing sector. Now, I would like to finally um, take, let you take a look at how significant is trade. You know, uh, the red, red uh, chart is, is China, the purple is Japan, the blue is Hong Kong, the green is India. And if you look at the finals around, we are talking about, you know, China is exporting something like $170 billion U.S. a year. This is exports. And, and, and Japan is exporting something like, you know, uh, eight, $80 billion. And Hong Kong is doing somewhere around $40 billion. And, and India is doing somewhere around $20 to $30 billion. Now, this is the, these... And where are they going? Of course, they're going to, to EU and USA, a big part of it. And the question is, who in his right mind can say this can, we, we could be decoupled from what's going to happen to China, uh, sorry, to, to the United States and European Union? It's, uh, if, they, if they don't do well, the external side is not going to do well in Asia because we have become so integrated to the global economy. You know, uh, 30 years ago, it wouldn't happen, but today it will happen. And, and, and uh, now let me move very quickly to some forecasts of real GDP growth. It's not mine, I just take it. And I'd like you to remember a few things. And, and starting in 2011, these are some forecasts, we don't need to believe it, but we're looking at Japan growing about two to one and a half percent all the way up to 2016. And in China, we're talking about forecasting 9% to gradually decline to 7.6% in 2016. And India is growing at 7.6% and then rising to 8.6% in 2016. And Hong Kong is going to happily mow around 4.8 around to 4.3%. Now, uh, remember the magnitudes, right? You know, China is looking about, on average, a high 8 number. This is a forecast done by a very respectable uh, unit, but uh, you know, economic consultancy company. Right? So let me move on and then come back to China's 12 five-year plan. According to China's 12 five-year plan, China wants to sustain growth over the period 2010 to 2015 at 7%. Now, 
This is really mind-boggling. People are predicting that China will be growing at 8.5% when China actually wants to grow at 7%. Uh, what, that, that is a very unusual situation that we face. An economy, the policymakers say we want to grow slowly, and everybody pre is predicting that it will grow very, despite the 12-5 to 12, five year plan, it will still grow. Now this is a very serious problem. Now if the forecast is correct, and if the planners really want to do that, something is not going to line up. Something is not going to line up. And this is what I would like to talk about. And, and I've just summarized, um, you know, urbanization is expected to rise at about 4%, which is what uh, Victor mentioned. Price of stability, 5% unemployment rate. They want to promote private consumption. Minimum wage to rise at 13% per annum. Pension schemes to cover all rural residents and 357 million urban residents. Constructing 36 million low-income homes and service sector to rise by 4% as a share of GDP. And of course, the coastal re regions will turn from a world's factory to hubs of R&D, high-end manufacturing and service. Foreign investment is welcome in modern agriculture, high-tech and environment protection industries. Breakthrough in emerging strategic industries and value added of output to account for 8% of GDP in these strategic emerging industries. Wow, very rapid move. R&D expenditure to account for 2.2% of GDP. And we'll have three, and they want to have 3.3% patents per 10,000 persons uh, over the next five years. Now this is the plan. And here is what I want to show you, which uh, is a, the blue line is the share of consumption in GDP. And the red line is the share of investment in GDP in China. And what has happened is, somewhere around 2000, something dramatic happened to consumption. It just dropped dramatically from around 46% of GDP down the way to 34% of GDP. Uh, this is also unprecedented. unprecedented. Most of China's history, consumption is about 50%, which is pretty much what the region looks like. Right? But then something happened dramatically. And what has happened is China actually in the last 10 years, for a variety of reasons, have been really pumping investment very rapidly. So rapidly that it is a little bit unbelievable and you get very worried. And actually the Chinese authorities are getting very worried and they want to reverse it. But the forecasters say they still go at 8% when they want to go, that means they don't believe they will reverse it. They don't believe they will succeed in reversing it because actually reversing investment is non-trivial because um, uh, there are political economy effects of it. Uh, there are uh, ability to roll back institutional change. And it's, if you don't do it well, what happens is uh, you can cut investment without promoting consumption. Uh, because whereas you're moving wages to uh, uh, raising wages, are you encouraging people to consume? It may or may not happen. Uh, actually, if you really think about it, because consumption is already so low as a share of GDP, which is 34%, in, you have to promote consumption to grow very significantly in order to raise the ratio up. You see, because when you are 30, when, when one third of the economy is consumption, you really have to move consumption up very dramatically just to get the ratio to tip back up, uh, which is non-trivial. I mean, you can go home, work on an Excel, I'm not going to show it here, work on an Excel and see how much consumption needs to grow faster than GDP in order to get the percentage, the ratio to go up. Now, if you cannot shift this ratio, it will be very difficult to shift another number and that is the current account surplus. Because to get the current account surplus to come down, you need to do something else. You need consumption to rise in order to get the current account surplus to go. So China is in the middle of a very significant structural rebalancing, which, uh, as I believe, the markets actually are not believing it will happen, because that's, that's the forecast. Now, that is a very serious matter. If they, if they don't solve that problem, if, if they fail to make that adjustment, then two things could happen. One is they fail to cut investment, 
and consumption is still low. So, so what happens? Uh, you run, begin to run more debt. Then a few years down the road, uh, China will have a lot more debt and they'll become more like Europe and America. Suppose they succeed in cutting investment uh, over a lot of resistance. Then the question is, they're cutting investment. Are they able to change the ratio between investment and consumption as a share of GDP? If they don't manage to get consumption to grow up, but they only cut investment, then GDP growth rate will really slow down, right? It will slow down quite dramatically, probably. Uh, we do not know which scenario happened because I'm not going to make that prediction. Uh, largely because it's not easy to make that prediction, but I think there is a dilemma there. There's a very serious, and I think it's a dilemma that the Chinese authorities have to wrestle with. Now, whichever way happens, this is very closely tied, this, this imbalance between consumption is very closely tied with another fact, and that is can you correct the serious current account surplus that China has with the rest of the world. Which, as the US and the Europe slows down, this, the political aspects of that dimension relating to that this is a problem. Now, this is, whether this is a problem is another matter, but the politicians will definitely believe this is a problem. And when everybody believes that, the global environment becomes very stressful. So I see a number of challenges. Well, that's what economists are good for, you know. Good at, not for. <laughs> so, you know, tell you what's the problem, and then leave it to the politicians <laughs> uh, to deal with it. Uh, so my forecast is, uh, uh, is that uh, it would be a tough job being someone in China, in, uh, in power. It would be very difficult. I think it would be not easy to persuade people. And uh, you, the most important thing is, how do you get consumption to, to, uh, to shift the, the ratio between investment and consumption? I think there are some ways that it could be done better uh, than others. And I think uh, the authorities are certainly debating it. Um, and I think I, I will take some hope that um, uh, of all the 12, five years plans that have been implemented, they have all been successfully implemented except for the one uh, the Cultural Revolution, so they might happen. Uh, I, I recall 30 years ago, I predicted you know, the growth rate of 10.8% per annum over 30 years would never happen. Right? So I was dead wrong. Uh, so I've, I've learned my lesson, not to predict again, but only tell you the challenges. <laughs> of the running bee, actually it's intimately tied to this problem. And it's tied to the investment problem. Because how can you make the running be gradually more international in any sense? And the most important thing is, how can you get all that offshore running be back into China? That is the issue. At the moment, you know, you have a lot of running be out here. Now, what, what is the purpose of holding running be if all it can do is just settle some of the trade between Malaysia and Hong Kong? That's, that, that is not enough. The big part is to get the remedy back into China. That is the now, to make that happen, if you need financial liberalization to some extent in China. And once you have financial liberalization to some extent, then something dramatic will happen. That will be great news. What is the great news? Investment as a share of GDP will actually come down because the financial sector will allocate the resources efficiently and they will have a good balance between investment and consumption. Interest rates will reflect opportunity cost of funds and they will go to the right. So actually having renminbi be, be allowed to return to China is a quasi opening of financial repression in China. So that, that is very good. Would it be easy? Well, that is intimately tied with the factor whether you can get investment as a share of GDP down. Because the reason why investment as a share of GDP is not down is the institutional and structural factors encourage investment. All right? uh, so this is, so getting the remedy back is very significant. Uh, we'll, at the moment, 
at the moment, you know, why are we holding Renminbi B? I declare I hold some Renminbi B. But that was because, you know, I have nothing else to hold. That this value would, would have any certainty. You know, the policy uncertainty that, that uh, you know, uh, Professor Davis talked about. Uh, so, but then it's not doing very well now at the moment. It has come down. So basically, you are, most people are holding running the largely for speculative precautionary reasons, not because there is a good use for that money at this moment. And that is the key, crucial issue. Now, to do that, uh, you need gradual relaxation. Of course, it would be a controlled relaxation, but gradual relaxation to get money back into uh, to China. So I think that will... So the challenge of making the renminbi internationalized, to balancing the current account balance uh, so that the surplus will, be, will come down, and shifting investment into consumption are actually three tied up decisions. Any progress in any dimension will be desirable. And that is the great political challenge for the next five years, which the 12 five-year plan audaciously say they want to tackle, right? Uh, uh, your forecast, uh, not mine. Thank you very much.